Hello, this is Dr. Eric Bricker, and thank you for watching A Healthcare Z. Today's topic is how do actuaries model healthcare costs? Now, once again, I think I have topped myself as like the most boring topic humanly possible in healthcare finance. We're talking about actuaries modeling healthcare costs. Now, this is meant in no way to disparage actuaries. What they do is very important, and I want people who are actuaries to like comment on this video and add your thoughts to what I'm about to present. But for many of us non-actuaries, it's kind of a mystery. They come up with this like projected healthcare cost amount for an employer client. It could be like a self-funded employer and they're like, this is what their healthcare costs are gonna be. And it's like, well, how in the world do they get to that number? Let's figure out how they do it. So they, first of all, you gotta start with historical claims. So for, usually they want 24 to 36 months of historical claims and they want both paid and pending claims. Now they also need enrollment data. They need to know how many lives were on the plan by month for those 24 to 36 months of claims that they had. Um, and that's important because some people will be on for, all, for some people will be on for all 12 months, but some people will only, you know, let's say a baby's born in June, well, then they'll be on for June through December. Or let's say somebody gets added on, you know, they're, they're in an open enrollment, but then they get fired or they quit. And so they're no longer on the plan. You get the point, right? So you got to have the enrollment by month. All right. And we're going to talk about that more specifically in a little bit. Next, typically those claims costs are broken down into big categories like inpatient, outpatient, physician, and prescriptions. And then they also look at the very large claimants that hit the specific stop loss level as well, typically about $100,000 uh, for a claimant for a 12 month period of time. All right, and then they calculate, this is really important, the per member per month amount on those historic claims. To do that, you take the total claims amount, both paid and pending, because pending a lot of stuff, they're like, oh, well, we've requested medical records. It takes 60 to 90 days to actually pay a claim. You want to know about those pending claims as well, because they um, might ultimately be paid. They probably will. Okay. So you want the total claims expense, and then you divide it by the total member months. Okay. And calculating the total member months is not super complicated, but it's important to understand. Okay. So let's, because like I said, some people are on for all 12 months, but some people are only on for parts of a year, certain number of months. So let's just say you had like a one year period of time and you only had five members. You had member A, B, C, D, and E. Member A was on for 12 months. Member B was on for 12 months, January through December, January through December. Member C was only on for six months. Member D was on for nine months. And member E was only on for two months. So when you add all that up, that comes up to 41 member months. And they, their claims totaled 27, this is a hy hypothetical uh, number. Their claims totaled $27,000 for that period of time. So then you take 27,000, you divide it by the 41 member months, and you get $659 per member per month. And that's the, do you use the per member per month? That's sort of the, the way that you adjust for different uh, size groups in terms of enrollment, in terms of people coming off the plan or to keep it com coming onto the plan. So you wanna get everything down to a per member per month number. Now, next, in order to make this forward looking, in order to model it out, in order to make a pro projection, in order to make an educated guess, then you have to apply medical cost trend. Okay, so medical inflation, all, the reason why they break down the claims by inpatient, outpatient, physician, and prescription is because they oftentimes apply different cost trends to those different categories. So um, so for the most recent numbers for 2025, the cost trend for inpatient is about five to 6%. For outpatient, it's about five to 6%. For physicians, it's about five to 6%. And for Rx, it's higher though. It's about seven and a half to 8%. So if you would then apply those different inflation amounts to those historic claims in those different categories, and you might get a blended overall medical inflation rate of like six or six and a half percent. Okay, next you want to apply, okay, well, is there going to be an increase in utilization? And this is where, like, something like COVID, um, it dramatically reduced utilization, and then in the subsequent years, it, it increased, sort of making up utilization as well. So you, you need to project out if there's any major swings in utilization. Now, in many cases, for many groups, in many years, there's not major swings in utilization. Okay, 
But then the next thing you need to uh, take into account is if there's any new treatments or new drugs. So of course, the biggest one that's happening now are the GLP-1s. And so when they're modeling out, when they're applying trend, is there a specific amount of the Rx spend, Rx trend, that they need to um, uh, take into account for the addition of these new GLP-1 medications. Are there any regulatory changes? Uh, with the Affordable Care Act, this was a big deal because there were certain things on the plan that they didn't necessarily cover before, and then when they made those regular ch regulatory changes with the ACA, now they need to cover those things. And so then the cost going forward would go up uh, it, higher than the, the historic claims. Okay, so you apply that trend, all right, next you adjust for plan design changes. Okay, in other words, if you do things like increase the deductible or increase the cost share in the form of, let's say, higher coinsurance or higher out-of-pocket max, then that's going to decrease the claims cost for the plan. So, let's, so for example, let's just say the deductible goes from $500 to $1,000. Well, then the actuaries know, and this is where they have those actuarial tables. They've got lots of benchmarking historical data, right? So, what, oftentimes when you're hiring an actuary, what you're hiring is their sort of proprietary historical data sets, their actuarial tables that they then use to come up with like, okay, if you increase the deductible from 500 to 1,000, then it, sh it should decrease the employer's overall claims cost by 4%. Okay, who in the world walking down the street would know that that number is 4%? No one would know that. However, because those actuaries have those tables, those are sort of the proprietary numbers that you would need to hire an actuary in order to get at. Okay, then are there network changes? So in other words, if you go to a more narrow network, again, that will lower costs as, as well. I won't get into why that happens. That's another video for another day. Or if there's a benefit enhancement. So some employers are like, we want to offer in vitro fertilization on the plan. We didn't last year. Okay, well, if you're going to offer in vitro coverage for in vitro fertilization, then that's going to make your healthcare costs go up. And the actuaries will be able to look at tables and to say, okay, well, how much will your claims go up if you decide to add a benefit like in vitro fertilization? Okay, next, step five. Now, you need to exclude large claimants who are non-recurring. So believe it or not, this is when brokers would actually call me up and be like, hey, Dr. Bricker, could you look at some of these large claimants and let me know if they're recurring or not? Because a lot of the times, the, um, the underwriters or the actuaries, they like to keep these high cost claimants in the overall claims figure because they're like, oh, well, this high cost claimant is going to continue on out into the future. And that might not be the case. A very basic example of why that might be the case is because the person has died. They've expired. Okay, well, I think most actuaries would probably take them off if they expired, right? Another example might be a person who's on dialysis who like leaves the plan either because they, um, uh, they got onto a different insurance or maybe the uh, the employee themselves just went to a completely different job. So they're like, this person was costing you 60 to 120 grand a year in dialysis and like they're not on your plan anymore. So you don't have to include that in your projections going forward. And then there's other times where there's there might be a high, you know, a high cost claim, let's say from a, a complex cardiac case. But a lot of times when people get like heart stents or, or even a cabbage, what have you, like they can do great afterwards. And like they're really not going to incur a lot of healthcare costs afterwards if it's a highly successful cabbage or stent placement, like they can do great um, and, 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 and generate very few claims in subsequent years. Okay, then they also then, step number six is they take into account any demographic changes. So this might be for like a large em uh, employer that is like offering like early retirement to a whole bunch of employees. Let's say they have high turnover where they're expecting a whole bunch of their older employees to come off their plan because they're offering early retirement and they're either not gonna replace them or they're gonna replace them with younger employees, right? So there might be major demographic changes that changes the age profile of the plan and therefore would change the risk. If the age goes down, the risk goes down. If the age goes up, the risk goes up. And then finally, or somewhat finally, then they put on a risk margin. They're like, look, this is still a projection. It's an educated guess. So let's put a two to 5% buffer in whatever dollar amount that we're saying, right? And, so, and then let's compare that to other somewhat similar groups from the past. Let's actually benchmark this. Again, the actuaries have all these tables and all this historical benchmarking information, which you as an individual employer might not have. And then typically the, the, the actuary will give you sort of a high, 
buy a medium and a low range for that PMPM. -PM. Okay, so the magic number, what, what finally is spit out of the computer at the end is this sort of magical PMPM -PM number. And there might be three PMPM -PM numbers, a high PMPM -PM number, a middle PMPM -PM number, and a low PMPM -PM number. And you're like, well, how in the world do they come up with that PMPM -PM number? And now you know. And that's my point for today. Thank you for watching A Healthcare Z.